Um, so uh, before we get started, I'm just saying thank you to everybody who showed up. This is actually my first conference talk I've ever done before, so appreciate it. <laughs> cool. So the title of my talk is The Psychology of Player Engagement. Um, before we get into that, uh, just a little bit about me. I am the user research manager at Pickpock. Uh, before that, I was working at Epic Games, and before that, I was at Full Sail University where I was studying um, game design with a concentration in UX research, but I also worked on a lot of products for Wargaming, THQ Nordic, and Creative Assembly. And due to that, I have a pretty good um, background in psychology, so something I'm pretty, I'm pretty passionate about. Cool, so let's get right into it. Um, why should you care about this presentation? Because we, as game developers and game designers and people who work in games, we are in the business of fun. Games are interactive experiences. Unlike books, music, and film, games require input from the player to go through the experience. People play games for all sorts of reasons, so understanding what is fun for our players and how to keep them in the game and giving them the best kinds of experiences are things we need to care about. Understanding psychology and user experience helps us make the best games possible and how we can apply this information into our games. So, what makes for a great experience? Well, there's a lot. There's a lot of things that go into making games, especially since they're interactive. Players can do all sorts of kind of things within the game. How do we make sure that players are having a good time? Um, for this talk, uh, I'll be mainly focusing on these topics. Emotion, behavior, cognition, and flow. There's a lot of other stuff I could talk about, and there's a lot more nuance involved in each of these, but due to time, I'm just gonna do a quick overview of these things, specifically. So, let's start with emotion in games. Basically, how does the game make players feel? So, we'll start with emotional engagement. Um, there's a lot of things within this, uh, no, whether intentional or unintentional. Games cause players to feel things, and we want players to feel the things that we want them to feel. We want players to experience their games through st story and narrative, audio, art, and gameplay. So let's start with story and narrative. Well, I'll not be going into detail about what makes for a really good story and narrative. I'm not a writer. I'm not, I don't do this kind of thing, but I understand why it's important. And all games have some sort of story and narrative component and we need to understand how that affects the player's experience. So, interesting theme and setting in world relates to what the game is about, where it's set, and what, the, and what players are doing within the game and how they're interacting. While you may think this is specifically related to you know, story-driven games such as Mass Effect here, it can be applied to many other kinds of games that aren't necessarily story-driven. For example, um, players who are interested in post-apocalyptic media may be interested in them because of the story to tell in these worlds and the kinds of things that players go and interact with. Um, survival in the face of disaster, interpersonal conflicts, despair, hope, and escape from the situation that the characters find themselves in. It's kind of like a vehicle for these stories. Also, the game needs to be interesting enough that players want to e explore and learn more about the world. For plot and character interactions, Obviously, the more complex the narrative is, the higher the likelihood players will feel connection to the characters and the narratives. So games like Mass Effect lean really heavily on these plot and character interactions to provide players um, you know, the chance to connect with these kinds of characters on a wide range of you know, personalities and different kinds of characters. Just like in other forms of media, like in film, TV, and books, um, using plot devices like cliffhangers and foreshadowing games helps build anticipation in players to find out what happens next. I'm sure you've all experienced a, a time where you just couldn't put down a book or a TV show or you know, any sort of kind of media like this and ended up binging the whole entire series in a week or read the entire series of a book in a, a, spanner, or like a span of days. Games that can utilize these kinds of plot devices like The Last of Us exhibit this same kind of experience in players, and it can be very hard to put the game down and do something else, because we're just so engaged to find out what happens next. Next is environmental storytelling. This relates to the story that the world tells the player without using any dialogue. Objects, characters, and events that occur or that are placed in the environment 
in a game can have massive impact on the feeling players have through the experience and of the experience. Remains of wreckages, bombed out buildings, notes left behind people in rooms are great examples of how you can do this. My, one of my favorite examples is in Left 4 Dead. When you go to the safe houses, there's notes left behind other survivors who are having arguments with each other or just discussions about things like, I think I saw a zombie poop. Do they eat feet? <laughs> it's not, it doesn't do anything to the game, but it's funny and it makes you feel like the characters are real even though you don't even see them. It's just you in the world with your other companions, but it makes the, feel, the world feel more alive and other people have gone through the same areas that you have. It helps build empathy. So everything I related to and talked about just now has been you know, for games that have story and narrative elements. But just because a game doesn't have a really fleshed out narrative or story doesn't mean there can't be story in them. Um, story machines, which is a term used by Jesse Shell in the book um, Art of Game Design, is a strategy employed by sandbox games to allow players to create their own story from gameplay, which is very similar to the concept of emergent gameplay. Games like Minecraft, The Sims, or Civilization do this really, really well as it gives players a set of tools they can use and let them do whatever they want with them. Players can build their own stories with these tools and create their own narrative for the character or their world. Cool. So now let's move on to my audio. So why is audio important? Um, I'm not an expert in audio either, uh, or composing or sound design. I don't really know how to do it. There's people who are much better than I could. But what I can say is that audio plays a massive role in the experience of any media, um, including especially games. It helps set the tone and mood of the scenes and experience that you're going through. Audio that can accurately depict sounds in a realistic fashion enhances emotional reactions within players. It also helps build immersion in the world, reducing the number of unrealistic sounds with good audio goes a long way. If your character has a sword and swings a sword against a brick wall, that should sound different than a sword hitting wood, for example. Good music and good backing soundtracks is also subjective, but this is more about how does the music enhance the experience? Does it complement what is happening in the game? And how does it make the players feel? Music can cause physiological and psychological effects within people. For example, high-pitched high strings in horror movies are used to create fear, minor keys are used to create sadness, and major keys are used to show happiness and energy. Music helps set mood and tone for the experience. Audio is so important and impactful, it can even change the feel of an entire scene just with a few tweaks of editing and some new music. So, watch this video. Before we die, I think we ought to discuss the bonus situation. Right. Right now, we think we deserve full shares, right? right. You get what you contracted for like everybody else. Yes, but everybody else uh, gets more than us. The crew of the Nostromo are headed home. And the first thing that I'm going to do when I get back is get some decent food. I'd rather be eating something else, but uh, right now I'm digging food. <laughs> There's just one problem. Where's Earth? Intercepted a transmission of unknown origin. SOS. I don't know. Human. <laughs> it's not my contract to do this kind of duty. I want to go home and party. But none of them could have expected who or what was waiting for them. <laughs> it's a cat. <sighs> <laughs> now, this extraterrestrial is coming aboard. Now, anyone see this thing and catch it in the net that Parker's holding Parker? I don't want any heroics out of you, all right? <laughs> and driving the crew crazy. In space, no one can hear you purr. Alien. Look, I'm not gonna do any more work. We get this straightened out. If you have any trouble, I'll be on the bridge. <laughs> so for those of you who haven't seen Alien, um, the, this film is nothing like this. It is a horror thriller movie. It is 
pretty scary. But basically, the reason I showed this video is because you can take something that was originally supposed to be scary and thrilling and com a completely different experience, put some audio on it, change up you know, the dialogue and the narrator, and now you have a comedy film. Cool. So let's move on to art. So good art is also subjective. And once again, I'm not an artist. Um, but people have been using art to tell stories and convey emotions since the dawn of time. Um, cave paintings, like for example. Um, in games, it's arguably one of the most important, if not the most important aspect of a game. Arts, art is the visuals. Players will be constantly looking at what is on the game, and that's why art's important. Art should be used to complement the theme, narrative, and gameplay. It also, like audio, helps set the mood and tone for the game. Thinking about how players will perceive the characters and how they're dressed, or how they're drawn, or how the UI is presented will impact someone's experience of the game. Art directly impacts our perception about the game and can help increase a player's emotional investment in it. You can, take, you can make things look super, super stylish like in Persona 5, with just a really, really interesting and new art style to make players feel like they're being a badass or like they're a sneaky thief or they're kind of doing this really, really cool gameplay. So take a look at this photo and think about how this photo makes you feel. How does the lighting, colors, and environment that this piano in make you feel? If there was music being played on the piano or in the background, um, what kind of music do you think would be playing. So most people think, okay, probably somber music's playing, some kind of sad music. What happens if there's really, really joyful music being played? How would that change the context for this scene? People always say that pictures are worth a thousand words, but how many words is a video game? Cool. So now let's go on to gameplay. Why is gameplay important? Well, duh, it's a game. Gameplay is important. If we don't have gameplay, we don't have a game. So more specifically, is it enjoyable to play? Do players have a good time playing the game? Does it cause players to feel the desired effects of the experience that we want to have players to have in the game? How does the story, narrative, art, and audio complement the gameplay, and how does it create a more holistic experience? And lastly, does the gameplay help maintain players' interest in the game over time? If we have players stopping to play the game or not playing the game anymore, then we don't really have an enjoyable game, perhaps, and we don't want players leaving the game. A great example of this is in Doom Eternal. The entire game is designed around trying to make you feel like a badass. If you're low on ammo, use your chainsaw to saw a demon in half. Low on armor, light enemies on fire with your flamethrower. Low on health, run up to a, a demon do a glory kill, and rip its head off. The game makes you feel like a badass by encouraging you to keep moving fast, blowing up demons, and doing all this crazy gameplay with a cool, realistic art style and an intense electronic metal soundtrack, further enhancing the experience and making you feel really, really awesome. I listen to this when I go to the gym all the time. <laughs> Next, it's pacing. Pacing is extremely important in games as it helps create a good rhythm. High intensity sections of gameplay are great and really fun for players, but if you keep it around for too long, players will get tired of it and it becomes tedious and you get overloaded and you can't focus anymore and it's just too, it's too much. So we need to counteract these high intensity sections of gameplay with slower paced sections as well. If everything's always really high paced, then nothing is really high paced because there's no basis of comparison. So ways you can do this are you know, having change-ups in gameplay where you were doing a lot of combat and then you go into an exploration kind of area and now you're doing some puzzles to get to the next area. Or there's a lot of more narrative in this specific part and exposition. Although we're talking about gameplay specifically, right? Um, this generally is important as well as in the terms of storytelling and narrative. How does it combine with the storytelling and narrative with these different kinds of gameplay? We don't want to have really crucial story and narrative aspects in high-intensity sections of gameplay, because players won't be able to pay attention to it. 
if you try to you know, tell someone how to solve a puzzle during a high impact, high intensity section, they're probably not going to remember it, they're gonna miss it, and then they might feel frustrated later on when they don't know how to solve the puzzle or get to the next area or know where to go. A really good example of this um, is in Super Mario Odyssey. Um, in the game, there are, there's not that many mechanics to the game. It's pretty simple if you look at it, but the game is designed in a way to take advantage of these simple mechanics to provide players new, interesting kinds of gameplay and change-ups and very, very novel ways to utilize the tools that the game's provided players for new and interesting experiences. They didn't necessarily have to make a bunch of new, different uh, mechanics to, to make it, you know, I guess, new and novel. They just utilized their old stuff in an interesting way. Cool. So that's it for emotion. We're going to go into behavior now, which is basically, what do you want players to do in your game, and how are people playing your game? So behavioral psychology is a very large field in psychology that relates to mainly understanding human behavior and what kinds of things directly affect and influence behavior. There's a lot more things to talk about in this section, such as reward structures and consumer psychology and how people you know, perceive um, buying things in a marketplace. But uh, I'll be focusing on these three things specifically, intrinsic and extrinsic motivations, self-determination theory, and shaping player behavior. So let's start with motivation and how it relates into video games specifically. So extrinsic motivations are characterized by behaviors driven to earn external rewards. This term refers to something you gain by doing actions or things in your environment or in your life to get a reward specifically. In games, these are things like currency, money, experience points, items, but also fame and praise from others. That is also a reward. You want to, you know, you want to get to the highest rank to have other people think you're really good. But not all rewards are positive. There are also negative rewards and punishments. These are things like losing items, losing XP, gaining debuffs, but also losing buffs that you previously had. Something to note here is that players are actually highly motivated to prevent the loss of things. This is known as loss aversion. It is so motivating that sometimes the motivation to prevent a loss for something is greater than the, the motivation it is to earn something. So think about how you can utilize this information and how that relates to your reward systems is important. Now onto intrinsic motivations. This is specifically about behavior driven by satisfying internal rewards and desires that a person has. These are motivations that come within and are often known as just an inner drive. These are motivations and behaviors to fulfill that motivation that are done without the external reward that is driving that specific behavior. We're doing them because it's inherently interesting, enjoyable, or satisfying for the person doing that thing. Since these are self-driven, they're pretty hard to quantify. So a bunch of really smart people came up with something called the self-determination theory, which is broken up into three components. Essentially, autonomy, also known as agency, um, com competence, and relatedness. So, autonomy. This is the desire to be causal agents of one's own life and act in harmony with one's integrated self. That's just a really, really, really fancy way of saying people don't like to be told what to do and, what, and want to make their own impactful choices. People want to see their actions have consequences and impact over the surroundings and experience. In games, this is often done by allowing players to different dialogue choices, having different branching paths of gameplay, um, character customization, classes, jobs, weapon choices, you name it. But it's also about giving players a sense of the illusion of control. Well, using the illusion of control to give players a sense of control. We don't have to give players control over every single situation, but if we make them feel like they're making a choice, that provides that automatically. So Dragon Age Inquisition is a great example of this, as it gives players autonomy, as it allows players to pick their own classes, 
customize their character's look, and pick different dialogue choices that have control over their character's personality, relationships, and overall plot. It makes people feel larger connection to the game. It makes them feel like they have impact over the story. Dragon Age Inquisition is great because the choices that I had made in the previous two games had led to a completely different experience than my friend who had done the same thing. When we were chatting about the game and our experience and why we liked it, he was often like, what are you talking about? I didn't experience that at all. Who's that character? It made me feel like my experience was my own thing that I had in my game. However, you don't need an incredibly complex branching storyline like Dragon Age to, to achieve this. The important part is that players need to feel that they have control over the game, even if their choices ultimately don't end up making much difference in the ending of the game. Um, Mass Effect made me really sad, but it's about the journey, not the destination. <laughs> the Stanley Parable is a great example of the illusion of control, where the game narrator discourages players from straying away from the yellow adventure line when in actuality, the game is designed for players to stray away from the Yellow Adventure line, and it's fun to make the narrator get mad at you for not paying attention to them. But that's how the game is designed, right? So it makes people feel like they have control over the, the game, and they're saying, I don't want to be controlled. I'm going to do whatever I want. But that's the point. Next is competence. This is the desire to control the outcome and experience mastery. Essentially, people want to get better at the thing they're doing and see themselves improve over time. This is with anything. You want to see yourself improve. You want to get better. It doesn't, it, like, it, just because this is about, we're talking about games, this is also related to your personal life. This is done by providing positive feedback on performance that, uh, that, you, that, you're, you know, that you're actually doing better, that you're doing the right thing and moving in the right direction. In games, we need to build this into the experience, and we need to let players know that they're doing well. Intrinsic motivations are also, well, competence in providing feedback is also correlated with increased intrinsic motivation. If players don't know how to do something, and they're struggling to do it well, they're probably going to stop playing the game because they don't know how to get better. And we need to show them how to get better and the tools available to them needs to be shown to them. So in games, this is things like tutorials, um, progress trackers, which show you how well you're doing towards a certain thing, um, health bars to show if you're fighting a boss, you can see the boss health going down, meaning you're probably doing the right thing, but also your health. If your health is going down too much, then you know you're probably doing something wrong. Um, feedback during gameplay is important. Um, you know, this is maybe pop-ups in the UI. Maybe this is also voice lines. Um, we just need to have feedback telling people how they're doing. But also things like skill rankings in competitive games are a great way to show players how well they're doing in the game overall and how their skill is improving over time. Um, this can be a great way to, to give players goals as well that they can work towards. If you say, you know, I want to get to, you know, Challenger and League of Legends, um, you now have a goal to get there and you know how well you're doing towards that goal. People just want to know how well they're doing, and we need to show them how they're doing it. Um, the Dota 2 post-game report is an excellent tool in providing players this kind of information that increases competency. Um, in this game, uh, I know how well I did. I can, in the bottom left image there, it, the two double green arrows basically indicate how well I did on this specific hero compared to my previous average. It makes me feel really good because I know for sure I did a really good job, and I can see in the right image with the red box how well I did for specific things like gold per minute, kills, deaths, and assists compared to my previous averages. It lets me know that I did really well, and I can go back if I really want to, to see how well I did and think about my new strategy and just keep on getting better. So next is relatedness. This is the will to interact with, be connected to, and experience caring for others. We are a social species. We want to be connected to others and have conversations with people and share stories. Like many other media forms, they're loved by a lot of people. People love games, people love TV, people love books. People like sharing things about their experience and connecting with others playing this game. I'm sure you've all discussed some sort of media that you really like, whether it be a book, movie, TV, TV series, or games. We just like doing this automatically. And since games are often a collaborative experience, this is really, really useful 
because then we can tap into that and get players to play together and think about how their strategy is going to go over time and you know, build systems in to support this kind of behavior. Playing game over voice chat is something we automatically do without even trying. We want to be able to talk to our friends while we're playing a game. So in games, these are things like community goals, social features like guilds and leaderboards, multiplayer like co-op and competitive gameplay. But discussing things with your friends in person or having forums and guides online. Um, this picture here is showing uh, Mobifier. It's a, it's a fan-run website, I believe, um, about what are the optimal builds and strategies and ways to play certain champions in the game. Players want to know how to get better and want to connect with other people to show them that, hey, I found a really, really cool guide. Uh, I have a really cool strategy to play this game. I'm going to show you. And you can see people liking it and saying, you know what, that's really good. I'm going to start doing that as well. Or, hey, I think your idea is really good. How about doing this differently? Cool. Bit of an error there. <laughs> But behavior shaping. This is basically using extrinsic rewards to make players behave in a certain way. Rewards should be used to get players to start playing and lead players into different aspects of the game. Rewards can be used to shape behavior and change what people are doing in the game. If you want players to behave in a certain way or, not, or seeing players not do something that you, that you like, you can give them a reward to encourage them to do so. Fortnite's missions and battle pass system encourages players to do certain actions in order to earn seasonal XP. Experienced Fortnite players might look at this um, quest of uh, says harvest 500 wood, 400 stone, 300 metal, and think this is kind of a dumb quest. Like this is what you're supposed to do, right? But it's there for a reason. New players who may be inexperienced with the game don't know that they need to do this. If they played a different kind of battle royale game, there's not building in them usually. And since you can build structures, and since it's a very, very useful strategy to win the game, you need to teach players and give them rewards to show them that this is good. It's a reinforcement technique. Players need to be shown in many, many different ways of what the things you want them to do. If players aren't building structures, go into a, a battle, and someone else is building structures better than them, they will probably lose. So one of the best instances of behavior shaping I've seen is in League of Legends, old tribunal system and reform card system. While this no longer exists, there's still a lot we can learn from it. Jeffrey Lin, formerly of Riot Games, talks about this in two GDC presentations. So League of Legends is known for being a very toxic game with a lot of negative behaviors that people do all the time. So the team at Riot devised this tribunal system to include the community to determine whether a player is being toxic. Since they had millions of players, they couldn't see all the players specifically, and there's too many matches. They can't see every single thing. So they tried to get the community to get into this. Basically, players would receive a video to watch and review to see if the player in question or players in question were acting in toxic ways or doing you know, negative behaviors. Players would then vote whether or not this was a negative behavior, and eventually that person would get banned if that was the, if that was the case. Before they implemented the system, players just get banned outright and say, oh, you've been banned for toxic behavior. You've been banned for leaving a game. Players were very confused as to why they were banned a lot of times. And with this system and the reform card system, players were able to understand specifically why they were banned. So with these reform cards, players would receive specific feedback and instances from the game on what they did to get banned. They would then publicly post every reform card online for the internet to see and discuss on forums. They did this because they wanted to see how players would react to this. In the talk, they go into more detail about how the system works, so I recommend you to take a look at this. But basically, the results from this are actually quite surprising. Players were seen apologizing for their behavior, seeing the errors of their ways, and feeling ashamed for their toxic behavior. Before the system, players who were banned would be upset and be confused as to why they were banned. But now they were seen specifically in text chat or actions they were doing that were toxic, were now able to see and connect the two, saying, oh, that's why I got banned. Providing specific and timely feedback is necessary to change behavior. After this change, 
Riot saw a massive decrease in negative behavior across all players in League of Legends due to the system. So, now let's go to the next section, which is cognition. Basically, how are players thinking about playing your game? How are players influenced by the game and others? And can players play the game effectively? So, we're gonna be talking about specifically cognitive psychology in games, which is attention, usability, memory, perception, there's a lot more we can talk about, but I don't have enough time to talk about that, and there's probably people better to talk about that than I, than I can. Cool, so we'll start with attention. Basically, how do we capture players' attention in a world of constant distractions? Attention is a limited resource that we can use to concentrate on information and stimuli while ignoring other information around us. The important part here is that we choose to concentrate on something while ignoring other things, stimuli. There's a concept called cognitive load, which is very similar to computer, computer RAM, actually. Um, you can only give someone so much information and tasks and things to do or things to look at or things to listen to um, before they're unable to process any more information. When this happens, people generally just quit. They just stop doing things. Um, this leads to decreased performance and inability to focus on tasks. Um, tasks imply, you know, trying to do math or, you know, trying to drive somewhere, things like that. Or, in our case, games, trying to do something. So, how do we as game designers and developers capture our players' attention in a world of constant distractions, whether it be your phone, the lights in this room, um, thinking about things related to, you know, your daily life, if you have something else going on. There's a lot of things going on in your head. So how do we do this? Naturally, people's attention will be captured if you have a personal interest in the thing. Um, that's just natural. We like thinking about things and focusing on things that we like. Um, story and gameplay are, in if the story and gameplay are interesting, then we'll pay more attention to it. But it'll also be captured through changes in our environment. Our brains are lazy and want to be as, fit, as efficient as possible. So they ignore a multitude of information, which allows us to focus more easily. However, our brain will always alert us of changes in our environment. So things like sudden appearances, like what I just did there, can be used to draw people's attention to something. If these changes persist long enough, then our brain becomes habituated to it and we start ignoring it like everything else. This is why when you go to Rotorua, you immediately smell how terrible it is. And then about 10, 15 minutes later, you kind of just forget about it, ignore it. You get used to it. Your brain sees this as a threat to your, new, to your environment, but realizes eventually that it's not going away. It's going to smell like crap the entire time I'm here. <laughs> I'm just going to ignore it. Color changes. Um, this is also useful. If you have a you know, specific UI element and it flashes red when you lose health, that'll grab our attention. And motion. Motion can be used to grab our attention. This is probably one of the best ways to do it. Um, the way our eyes work is you know, the, the center point around the pupil is very good at detecting color and detail-oriented things, and the outside peripherals are very good at detecting motion. This is likely due to an evolutionary advantage of if there's something flying over, over here, you want to be able to see it coming so you can get out of the way and recognize it. So using all this information, we can design better user interfaces, HUDs, and maximize the chance for our players to recognize and notice important information that we want them to notice, which allows them to succeed in the game. However, try not to overload your players with too much information. Don't, don't do this. This is an abomination of a HUDs up display. It's one of the worst things I've ever seen, but it's hilarious. It's obviously no game is ever going to have this HUD, hopefully. Um, but it, it shows an example of there's so many things you could put on the HUD that you want players to know, but should you? Should you keep on adding more UI elements into the heads up display or interface to let players know about some status change? You probably don't. You don't need to do all this. Please don't do that. There's also a concept called interintentional blindness. 
This relates to a phenomenon that happens when you're focusing so hard on a task that you start ignoring other things and other changes in your environment. This is best described in a video that many of you may have already seen, but let's watch this. This is a fun video. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? <laughs> Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this one. Cool. So that's a... <laughs> So that's a fun video. I like that one because people who have seen the original one are like, oh, I know what this is about. I'm gonna find the gorilla. And it's like, just kidding. People leave and the thing co changes color. But the important part here is how that applies to games. Imagine a player's focusing on trying to find and scan enemies in the environment in like Valorant or Counter-Strike. And you're gonna be looking at specific areas in the game, corners or hiding, natural hiding spots. But if a player, if an enemy player is in a place that isn't, expected, we will probably miss it. So next we have usability. This relates to how easy is it to use an interface. This is important because if play, people can't figure out how to play the game or do things in the game, people will become frustrated and stop playing the game. And we don't want that from happening. We want to remove these barriers from players to be able to continue playing through the game. So the Nielsen Norman Group outlines that usability is made of five components. Learnability, efficiency, memorability, errors, and satisfaction. So let's go into each one. First is learnability. How easy is it to learn how to play the game? Specifically, these are things like tutorials, first time user experiences, or user flows, depending on who you ask. But the point of these is to introduce concepts to the player and teach them how to play the game so they can succeed and do the things we want them to do efficiently and properly. However, these don't need to be very text heavy or very guided. Um, these can be more contextual and less guided via you know, NPCs in the game, using voiceover, telling you, you know, you're doing the right thing or you're going the wrong way. But it's important to know that pairing information with emotion is increased likely, it's an increased likelihood that players will remember that information. Using emotion in your characters that are teaching you something that you want to players to remember is a really good way of doing so. However, just try not to make them too annoying though, like Navi. Efficiency. How quickly can players perform tasks? This relates to control inputs, navigating menus, or equipping skills and items, going to a shop and selling things, buying things, tasks, basically, in the game that aren't specifically related to, um, well, not necessarily related to gameplay, but trying to do inputs in gameplay to do an action. So making sure that the game has really easy to use menus and the ability to do things in an easy, efficient, and non-tedious way is really, really good because if we notice these are bad, if players go through this and they think it's bad, they will notice it and they won't have a good time doing it. Max Effect 1's menu system is notorious for this. It's not very good. Despite the game being pretty good, people liking it a lot, this is often the most 
I guess, hated thing about the game. But it does mean you can still have a really good game and still have you know, bad menus. And people still play it. It's just not very fun to do. Next is memorability. When players return to the game after a period of not playing, how easily can players become proficient again? Essentially, we want players to remember how to do something after they you know, quit or go away for a little while. Players don't always play through the game in one sitting or you know, in a series of sittings. People sometimes play other games. How do we allow players to remember how to do things again? So some methods of this are displaying inputs in the HUD, like in Assassin's Creed Odyssey here. In the bottom left corner, it says, you know, press LT to go to this menu. It's reminding players to do things. Things also like contextual button pop-ups are important. When you walk up to something, there's a little icon that says, hold you know, A to interact. That's important. But also, things like returning player systems are a really good way of doing this. Final Fantasy XIV, which is a MMO, is a MMORPG, is a very complex game where there's a lot of things going on, especially in dungeons. There's a lot of things to remember. There's a lot of UI elements. There's a lot of specific things specific to that game that players probably don't remember if they quit after a while. So having systems like this, such as the DPS training exercise number one, reminds players that you probably shouldn't stand in the red circle, but also teaches players that these weird icons mean this specific thing. And this is a great system to teach players how to do it. And rewarding them with XP or money is a way to get them to do it as well. Next is errors. How many errors do players make? How severe are the errors? And how easily can er players recover, recover from the errors? Um, errors aren't always bad unless they're specifically about things that are irreversible. We kind of want players to make some errors in gameplay. That's kind of okay. Games must be fun. It's supposed to be keep on playing over and over again. But if you make an error in like selling an item or destroying something that you didn't want to sell, players are going to be really, really upset. We need to make sure that players don't do this by accident and have a way to reverse it. So confirmation dialogues like this photo here, good default options for players who may not know what the options are, what to do, just giving them the, good, the best the default option is, is good. Having an undo and buyback system from shops, but also being able to reset skill points. And satisfaction. Is the game fun? This is really hard. We don't really know if players are having a good time unless we see them play the game and have them give feedback on it. But even if that is the, what we're going to do, how do we know when a game is specifically fun? It's really hard to measure. So what is fun? That's pretty hard to say. I believe fun is you know, it's great in games, but they're often short-lived. They're often very sporadic. Sections of gameplay are really fun, and then it goes back. Things aren't fun if everything's always fun. Fun is also subjective. Fun comes in you know, troughs and peaks. If everything's always ratcheted up to the top, then nothing is higher than that. Nothing is lower than that. It's a basis of comparison. However, we do know that games that fulfill components of self-determination theory leads to intrinsic motivations and more engagement. So let's take a look at something called flow. So you may already know about this, but what I can uh, you know, tell you is how it comes about. So flow is basically a balance between challenge and skill level. Flow occurs when you're doing something, an activity, for the intrinsic purposes. This is important as we know that players become more engaged in things if they're intrinsically rewarding. And if they are, then players will likely enter a flow state. So how does it come about? Basically, knowing what to do and where to go, knowing how to do it, knowing how well you're doing, a balance between challenge and skill level, and freedom from distractions. While flow may be the ultimate uh, state of mind for games, well, for people, it's not necessarily what we want in games. We sometimes want people to put them in control, maybe relaxation, maybe anxiety in like a horror game. We want to put them into these kinds of areas, but not for too long. We want to get them around and move them in these types of areas. However, <laughs> this model is designed for a person performing work-related stuff. So we can take a look at e-game flow. A lot of things in here, but basically, one thing to keep in mind is that 
some aspects are more important than other kinds of games. Immersion, you may not think, is related to um, you, you know, games like Civilization, but you can be immersed in Civilization. It doesn't have to be a first-person shooter. Another important thing is that people have different flow zones. Hardcore players will probably have a, high, like a more difficult, well, we're going to prefer more difficulty in their games, and will then have a different flow versus players who are newer to games and find things very difficult. Someone who's playing Dark Souls and likes Dark Souls will have a different flow zone than somebody who plays The Sims. So, in an effort to elicit flow in a game, Genova Chen created the game Flow as part of his master's thesis, which was later remade and published by that game company. Using something called dynamic difficulty adjustment, we are able to program a system in which we can tune the game based on players' efficiency and skill level. Players are able to, to control and progress in difficulty at their own pace. Failure isn't overly punishing in this, and also increases player engagement and churn. This is commonly used in a lot of games, but most notably Mats 3 games. But even games like Resident Evil 4 will spawn less or more enemies depending on how players are doing. So how do we find out if players are having fun? Do some research. That's my job. As a user researcher, I analyze player behavior, cognition, sentiments to make the best game possible. That's the user research team. Hey, everybody. <laughs> So some common methods you can do is usability testing. Basically, finding pain points in the experience that players are having problems with getting through the game. Players can't get through the first gameplay section. Do some research and find out what specifically about it. Doing play testing to see how players play through your game. Understanding balancing and opinions. And also sending surveys to your players that are playing across a large population. What do they think and what do they want more of? So, our job should be to find and remove barriers to fun. That is the main goal that I have. If we can remove all potential barriers to fun, we will probably have a really good game, but it's not one to one. We want to make games that are enjoyable for our players and remove those things that we know are not enjoyable. So, we should be designing for engagement rather than fun. Engagement is much easier to track and understand and measure than fun. We can look at how often people are coming back to a game, how many game people are playing, how long they're playing. Things from analytics let us know this information. We need to have peaks and values and fun, so playtesting lets you know different experiences over time and how they're doing. So here's some general guidelines of designing for engagement. Does the game immediately capture players' attention? Are players sufficiently compelled to continue playing the game? Does the game evoke the desired emotions in players? Can people make meaningful impacts and decisions in the gameplay? Do players understand controls and rules of the game? Is the game sufficiently difficult compared to the skill level? Can they see themselves improve over time? Can they set meaningful and self-driven goals? And are there any major usability problems that prevent players from having fun? Um, I'll probably send this out later, so you don't have to write down all frantically. But um, basically, that's it. The end. <laughs>